Good morning, everybody. My name's Oriel Miller. I'm the director of the IWA, the Institute of Welsh Affairs, and I'm really pleased so many of you have joined us this morning. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction, and then we're going to get cracking with our panel. Uh, for those of you who don't yet know us, the IWA is Wales's leading independent think tank with a, a long track record of shaping debates and influencing change in Wales through policy research and advocacy. Our online and print publications, which provide platforms for robust comment and debate, and our agenda setting events. We're a membership organisation with members across the country and far further afield. We're funded by our members, the events we run ourselves, and independent trusts and foundations. This is the fourth in our Rethinking Wales discussion, and we're running them every Thursday at around about 11 o'clock. Thanks for your patience this morning. Next week, we're going to be focusing on the future of Welsh towns. For those of you who haven't joined us before, we started this series of discussions to shine a light on what matters most to people now in this, our new reality, and to start to look further ahead than the current crisis. We're deliberately bringing people together across policy boundaries because we're unable to meet in person. Before we get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about the changes that are all around us to help us frame the conversation afterwards. If we accept that these changes can be broken down into novel changes, things that have happened now because of the for the first time because of COVID-19, changes that are evolutionary, things that are changing still but aren't yet where we want them to be, and visionary changes, how we want the future to look, but which may not yet be achievable. <clears throat> what do these look like for you? Is there a shared vision about this? Who doesn't want to brave new Wales? Today, we're gonna to be focusing on the gendered impact of the pandemic. At times of crisis, there are some who might roll their eyes at a discussion of gender inequality, inequality and just talk about getting on with things. But it is that during these times that the life or death impact of our unequal society becomes even clearer. In any crisis response, gender needs to be a central focus because the fact of the matter is that the circumstances of COVID-19 and lockdown itself affect men and women in many, many different ways. Women are overrepresented in sectors that are either at the sharp end of caring for others or have been economically affected by COVID-19 and the lockdown health and social care, retail, hospitality. Men may be overrepresented in terms of certain public services, the bid men keeping the rubbish from piling up on our streets, as delivery drivers or public transport operators. In Wales, women make up 80% of health and social care workers and are more likely to take on unpaid, other unpaid caring responsibilities, such as looking after children or caring for elderly relatives or neighbors. Lockdown is hard for everyone, but hard is relative. For working women like myself, stereotypical middle-class privileged professional in a staunchly feminist household, my experience of lockdown is not about learning a new language, endless arts and crafts, or reading novels in the middle of the day. It's about juggling homeschooling three, three children of different ages with work calls that need to fit other people's schedules too, putting meals on the table, teaching life skills, skills washing nearly as much sports kits as ever, as we keep running, as well as thinking ahead about which of the elderly friends and relations may need shopping or digital support and how that's gonna happen. My perspective though, clearly, is what do I have to complain about? Nothing. I'm not worried personally about feeding my children from week to week or being able to pay my mortgage next month, or if I've got a job to go back to where I will be safe. But plenty of people are worried about precisely those things and have been for weeks. We know women have disproportionately borne the cost of austerity over the last decade. Planning a post-COVID-19 economy without the proper focus on gender would inevitably deepen that inequality. Women's health care is hard to navigate through and is trying at the best of times. This has been exacerbated as sexual and reproductive health care services have been cut, the lockdown causing clinic closures and shortages of contraceptives. And for some women, stay home, same sa stay safe, is an utter contradiction because their home is simply not safe. Since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, women's rights activists across the globe have reported surges in calls into domestic violence helplines, despite the fact that many women at home with an abuser will find it even more difficult to make that call. Governments must ensure that the services are funded and supported enough to help them if this, at this time. If not now, then when? 
Although today's conversation is focused on the different experiences of women and men, we also know that other intersections such as ethnicity have experienced different inequalities as a result of the pandemic. And it's been clear for a while now that the COVID-19 pandemic is disproportionately affecting black, Asian and minority ethnic people. Black men in the UK are four times more likely to die for the virus than their white counterparts. And some groups, particularly Pakistanis and Bangladeshis, face worse economic impacts as a result of the lockdown as shown by new IFS Institute for Fiscal Studies research. These are some of the serious challenges we face. Rethinking Wales is about looking ahead to what we can learn and how things can be better after COVID-19. What solutions should we be talking about today? What could we be doing right now? Can we remove red tape on access to birth control and family planning? Is there really any argument against immediate emergency funding for domestic violence support? Thinking bigger and further ahead, we've already discussed in previous sessions about universal basic income, UBI. Is this how we as a society might value work that the market doesn't value? What's been perceived as women's work? The Future Generations Commission, I think so, and made an announcement about that yesterday. <coughs> Should we restructure the working week? More and more employers are learning through lockdown to trust their workforce, to make their own decisions about juggling work and home life. Should that be a right more people have? Though we should, of course, recognise that flexible employment practices can benefit middle class people more than others. How might the role of unions be in reducing gender inequality after COVID-19? Delighted to see Sharana joining us now. Welcome. As we start to develop a practical plan for what we at the IWA hope will be a strong shift to well-being economics, how can we ensure our new economic models are gender literate? There's never been a more opportune moment to dismantle the patriarchy and to come out on the other side of this pandemic as a better, more equal society. We'll hear from our panelists in a minute, but we also want to hear from you in the chat room and on Twitter using the hashtag RethinkingWales. What are we going to do with all of this? We plan to use these sessions as a starting point to develop long-term policy ideas for post-COVID-19 Wales. Keep watching this space to hear about that work as it develops. Bit of housekeeping, you'll have already noticed that you've been muted by uh, the IWA team and we're going to use the sidebar chat for questions. To ask a question, please send the moderator a question by using the drop-down arrow so that it says to moderator. Please remember all chat questions are recorded. We're going to be keeping to an hour, but I realise we started a little late, but we will be also keeping the chat room open after midday so you continue to connect with each other. To our panel, really pleased to have such a great panel with here with us this morning. We've got Ali Abdi, who's Community Gateway Partnership Manager for Cardiff University and National Lead for the Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic National, National Youth Forum, that's a mouthful to say, for Race Council Cymru. Thank you. Keris Furlong, who's the Chief Exec of Huara Teg. Nesta Lloyd-Jones, who's the Assistant Director of the Welsh NHS Confederation, and Shavana Taj, who's the General Secretary of the TUC in Wales. We're going to ask each panellist to speak for five minutes on the following questions. In the current situation, what does Wales need to be thinking about in the long term? What are the immediate problems that we face as a result of COVID-19? But also, what might be possible now that previously wasn't? Ali, I'm going to come to you first. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Oriol. Uh, really pleased to be here. Thank you. So um, a lot of my work is based in the uh, kind of south area of uh, the city. Uh, these areas are home to large uh, BAME communities. And in fact, uh, Greystown was just recently uh, uh, named the most multicultural ward in the city. Uh, and as we know, people, like you just mentioned, from main backgrounds have been the largest mm -hmm. or the greatest hit uh, by COVID-19. Uh, and the ONS report has indicated that black men are four times more likely to die from COVID-19. And, obviously, and you also mentioned about the Bangladeshi and Pakistani ethnicities also have a significantly higher chance of dying than a white counterpart, even when adjusting for deprivation, uh, that's from the ONS. And, and with women, as we know, uh, in terms of the gender, back more every family, uh, and so too are they for BME communities. Um, and, and to think about the way that they've been affected particularly and how um, you know, they rise to the occasion whenever there's a recession, or there's an impact on our communities. Uh, well, widespread job losses will be felt most by them. Uh, they're particularly in precarious jobs, um, particularly and single mums. Uh, Bain workers are over a third more likely than white workers to be in precarious jobs, like I mentioned, demonstrating the increased risk to loss of hours and earnings. The biggest challenge I believe uh, Wales faces currently 
uh, you know, is, is, is number one is getting the nation on the same page, particularly with uh, central government sending out mixed messages, especially around uh, the easing of the lockdown. Uh, and know what we do know uh, about COVID-19 and how uh, it's particularly impacting uh, one of our largest communities here, uh, in terms of the BME communities living with us here in Wales. How do we ensure that we do everything we can uh, using the science and everything at our disposal uh, to minimise uh, that impact? Um, I would, and in terms of what Wales needs to be thinking about in the long term, well, we definitely need to be looking at um, how we can support those most at risk and most impacted. Uh, information needs to be clear uh, and in the languages of those communities, uh, instead of sending, like, like I said earlier, about central government sending out mixed messages. Uh, but how could we, and, our, and if our UK statistics office is showing also the social economic disadvantage uh, being faced by BME community at the risk of the coronavirus, how do we improve things going forward uh, for those groups? Uh, and I know, and, and I'd be lucky enough to sit on a few groups which have been put together um, by Welsh Government at the moment to, to really look at the impact uh, those BAME communities are facing and how we can, uh, you know, make, the, make some improvements there. So I look forward to, you know, sharing uh, more of that uh, and attending more of those conversations. Thank you, Oriol. Great. Thanks very much, Ali, for kicking us off. Karis, can I come to you next, please? Yeah, thanks, Oriol and, and Ali. Um, I mean, as Oriol's already given a great overview of some of the different impacts on on men and women in Wales as a result of the crisis. And our focus is particularly on the difference in their labour market position, but also in the home and how that impacts on men and women differently. At a very basic level, it's absolutely crucial that the crisis takes those differences into account. Um, and especially as we've talked about the experiences of those with additional protected characteristics, whether that is black men who are more likely to be at risk of death or specific groups of women who are more likely to be furthest away from accessing the labour market. Uh, and I think I'll come back to that in a second. We know and we've talked about um, over many years the precarious position that women find themselves in the labour market. They're more likely to be at risk of losing their jobs, having to take unpaid leave, or being exposed to the virus because of the nature of their jobs and frontline services. They're also at risk of being left without pay to depend on inadequate social security payments. And we know that both men and women need to be protected so that they can work safely in those environments, whether it's in retail, in health or in social care. Um, but I want to talk for a minute about child and elder care. And we know that women tend to bear the brunt of, of that in the home. Um, and they're most likely to be the lower paid member of the family or household. So there's a significant risk that this crisis will really reinforce and exacerbate gender stereotypes that already exist. And I'm really concerned about the return um, to work and, and the process of moving in out of the lockdown, that actually women could be the second tier um, able to access job opportunities, which are likely to be fewer as a result of the economic crisis that will surely follow. So if women are the lower earners in a household, if they have poor access to childcare, if schools are, uh, and transport do not reopen when they're expected back to work, it's entirely likely that men will go back to work first and we could end up with two-tier workplaces where big decisions are being made by men um, who are able to return first as the higher earners in households. Now, obviously, governments would be much better placed to understand some of these differences about the impact of the crisis on men and women if women's voices are in the room, involved in decision making at all levels. And you only have to watch the daily briefings from the UK government uh, to try and spot the woman who occasionally appears uh, or generally doesn't. And I think we should be really, really worried about that. Uh, who is making decisions on our behalf, um, not just in Wales, but at a UK level? And again, as Oriol's mentioned, there is a significant risk and it should worry us all about people falling into poverty, but also um, being at really extreme risk of abuse and violence within homes, but also online and, and in their workplaces. And we've seen some shocking cases of key workers um, coming under attack. There is some good work being done here in Wales. There's been some adaptation of the childcare offer. Um, we know there's investigation into the specific impact on, on BAME people and we are reviewing um, the recommendations that we made last year as part of the gender equality review to look at what immediately should be done in the, in the nature of this crisis. 
So we know that the crisis has already revealed the extent of inequality. Um, it's become really, really stark. It's not a surprise to those of us who work in this field anyway, but I think we really need to push back against the notion that we should be trying to return to normal because that's not the normal that I want to return to. Um, and in fact, there are some initial insights which suggest that those Western countries like the UK and the US with the greatest inequality are actually faring particularly badly um, in this crisis. And we should reflect very somberly on that, I think. Um, so our concern now will be about what does the framework for exiting the lockdown look like, but really not just at a level of principle, what does that look like in action? There are some real positives to build on, not least as we've all adapted to working in this very different way. Um, and for those people previously locked out of the labour market, and particularly disabled people, this must surely shine a light on how other people should be able to access the labour market once we come out of lockdown. But it's not enough just to give people laptops and, and access to the tech. We've got to think about what the workplace cultures that people will be returning to are like. Um, and, but there's, there's plenty to be positive about there. And I think the biggest thing that we all will be reflecting on is, is, is care and how we value care, not just social care, although absolutely crucial, but also caring for members of our families and communities and what we've all learnt there. With the changes that we've seen um, in childcare and unpaid elder care, we have to really reflect on whether the system that we currently have in place is, and I believe it is, absolutely propped up by informal family arrangements and people doing um, a lot of additional work for nothing. So that's not the normal I want to return to, and that's what we will be pushing for as we come out of this crisis. Thanks, Keris. Lots of challenges there and lots of things to think about and some reasons to be cheerful too. Nesta, we're going to come to you next, please, in terms of health and what's going on in the Confederation and what the kind of things are that you were thinking about too, please. Thank you, Emil. So the two immediate issues for our members who are the chairs and the chief executives of the health boards and the trusts and also Health Education Improvement Wales has been to support their local population and, and patients and support their staff during this pandemic. So in regards to patients and population, um, as other speakers have highlighted, the emerging evidence suggests that COVID-19 is having a disproportionate effect on some population groups. This includes those likely to be at risk of suffering severe symptoms from contracting the virus or dying as a result of COVID-19. Evidence in the UK and also internationally has highlighted that a higher proportion of men are being infected with COVID-19 and dying compared to women and adverse outcomes of COVID-19 seem to be associated with comorbidities, including cardiovascular disease and lung disease. And these are conditions that are more prevalent already in society in men and are linked to smoking and drinking. And as uh, Keris has highlighted, women carry a different kind of burden from COVID-19. Inequalities disproportionately affecting women's well-being and equal economic resilience during lockdown due to childcare and supporting older family members with, which typically fall on women. The impact on unpaid carers is significant and many are feeling anxious either of contracting COVID-19 and being unable then to care for their loved ones in their own home or if they're supporting someone who is vulnerable or is shielding in another household and they don't want to put that person at risk. And that's feedback that we, we are getting quite often. Also, as Oriel, you highlighted, accessing health services is also impacting on women. Pregnant women are part of the shielding group, so are experiencing greater isolation from friends and family. There are impacts on disruptive pre and postnatal care, with many women, women having to go for scans and tests on their own without their partner. And in childbirth, it is a very different experience as well, with partners needing to leave as soon as the baby is born. And couples who are, have been unable to undergo their IVF treatment, with some women now unable to have children in the future. And for trans people, especially people transitioning, it could have led to surgery and HR treatment being postponed. And those are just some of the examples around accessibility of health services during this pandemic. In relation to staff, 
the NHS in Wales is the biggest employer, currently directly employing nearly 95,000 people. And if you include social care in this number, this doubles to 180,000. And the majority of whom are women. 77% of people working in the NHS and between 83 to 87% in social care are women. And men and women working in social care both have significantly raised rates of death involving COVID-19. Additionally, BME men in the workplace appear to be disproportionately impacted by COVID. And if we look at the personal protective equipment, PPE, um, that staff uh, in or key workers have to wear, having access and being able to wear correctly fitted PPE is vital for the safety of staff. It has recently been highlighted, I know this is something that the TUC has previously highlighted, that the PPE, including masks and gowns, are designed for men, or specifically six <coughs> foot three tall men. Numerous evidence of women experiencing abrasions on their faces caused by having to pull masks too tight, others having to roll up their sleeves of their fluid repellent gowns. And this is, you know, on social media as well, where, you know, women are, are showing their scars from going to work. And BME staff have also highlighted that some forms of PPE may not be suitable. As well as the physical challenges, the pressures being placed on staff working within health and, and care due to COVID-19 are exceptional and, and that needs to be considered now and also in the future. And if we look at the, the long term and uh, the, the future of, of Wales and how the NHS with wider public, private and third sector should work together and we all have a vital role to play. Firstly, in regards to health inequalities, coming out of phase one of coronavirus, when we think about resetting the health and social care system, we have to think about how service respond to the inequalities issues which were apparent when we went into this crisis and which the crisis has increased. The recent Marmot Review, which was published before the pandemic, warned that the entrenched inequalities have not sufficiently moved on in England and across the UK in the past decade and COVID-19 will have deepen these health inequalities. Uh, Public Health Wales, who are one of our members, are currently undertaking a health impact assessment to explore the long-term impact of the stay-at-home and social distancing measures on different groups to ensure that they are protected and supported to mitigate any of these negative impacts. And this report is due out in the next couple of weeks. Secondly, it's around population, mental health and well-being. During the recovery stage, we can expect a significant surge in people requiring access to mental health services, either because of underlying mental health issues or due to the, the social distancing and the lockdown. This is no different for the health and care staff. However, we need to reset, not just recover, in supporting the mental well-being of health and care staff and recognising their personal sacrifices and loss often most keenly felt by those in protected groups. Thirdly, capturing the benefits of technology and innovation. The ramping up of digital technology in the health sector to respond to COVID-19 is a positive in many ways, allowing patients to access care and the NHS advice online. And this has been something that has been called for by by the public for many years, but the pandemic has meant that this has happened overnight to pe keep people connected and with their support networks. However, digital exclusion continues to exist and it will impact on the ability of certain groups to access services. And lastly, the future in regards to future female leaders. While 50% of the NHS chairs and chief executives are women, there is a lack of representation of BME colleagues, both at an NHS level, but also at a national level during the COVID-19 response. This does not reflect the reality in the frontline NHS and social care workforce, and it is vital to get the right voices around the table.
Thanks very much indeed, Nesta. Thank you. Shabana, can we come to you, please? Key role here for the unions as well, protecting, protecting workers and also cr helping to craft what the future needs to be for us all. Um, when, when the crisis uh, first started, um, we felt immediately that it was important that we reached out to not only unionised workers, but the non-unionised workforce mm -hmm. as well, and that everybody had a safe place where they could report in what was actually happening in their workplaces. And some of the, the rather strange practices that were occurring at the start of all of this, because there was a lot of confusion. And in fact, there still is a, a whole lot of confusion. And um, because of the fact that we have devolution, um, quite often, particularly when it comes to the media, there's mixed messaging. You've got Boris saying one thing, and we've got our first minister um, saying something different. And I'm glad that we have been more cautious than the UK in terms of easing of the lockdown. And I'm and I'm uh, and I'm actually grateful for the fact that you know I'm lucky enough to live in Wales and operate in Wales, where we do work in social partnership with the government. And that it isn't strange for us to 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 sit alongside um, the trade unions to sit alongside government and businesses as well, and to actually make some good decisions about what we do now, but also what we do in the future. Um, the the fact of the matter is that the the current crisis is actually just reinforcing existing inequalities um, within Wales and across the UK. We're not all in this together. A lot of people talk about that. Yes, we're going outside and, and people are clapping, but what happens after this pandemic is over? Are we simply just gonna sit, sit back and accept where we've been all this time? These workers have um, put their lives on the line. Many of them are extremely low paid. And in fact, many of them have no choice but to work additional shifts just to make ends meet. And that's the bit of, of, of the picture that is often missing when it comes to the media and, um, and some of the information that's out there in the public domain. Many people on, on the front line, many key workers are actually low paid. They have no choice but to work. Um, several of them are, um, you know, there are some workers who are shielding. Some of them didn't even receive letters in time. Many letters went to the wrong, whip, uh, wrong home addresses. The amount of cases that we were getting um, from individuals um, we, through our whistleblowing site and from the, the trade unions directly, um, from individuals who were saying, um, I know that I fall into a particular category. That's what the advice out there in the public domain tells me. However, I haven't received my shielding letter. They, those individuals were being bullied very openly by their managers who were telling them, unless you've got a letter, you've got to show up for work tomorrow. If you do not show up for work tomorrow, we will begin a disciplinary procedure against you. We had, and we continue to have many concerns for workers, particularly those who work in supermarkets, who work in retail, people who work in pharmacies, you know, those individuals who have continued working throughout this entire period and the amount of abuse that some of them have had to face from the public when simply they're just trying to do their jobs is, is quite frankly um, shocking and disgusting. And we've been talking to um, government and we've been talking to uh, at a UK level with the, with the retail consortium and saying to them, it's all fair and well, having nice social distancing outside of big supermarkets. But when you get inside, what happens then? And it was, there was a point where systems were put into place where there was a limitation of how many products one individual could take off the shelf. Now, the part of the reason for that was in order to ensure that we weren't, workers weren't consistently having to restock shelves. And now that's gone away and we're back to square one again, where people are um, going in, they're taking what they need, possibly taking more than they need, and uh, workers have no choice but to continuously play catch up. We've had um, some extreme you know, horror stories um, from all kinds of settings, particularly from call centers actually as well. There was, when this started, um, you know, the big thing that the, the public were talking about and the media were talking about was construction sites. Now, um, there's still problems with construction sites, absolutely. Um, PPE is an issue for those areas. It's difficult to uh, socially distance in those types of environments. 
But the fact of the matter was, is that within call centers, these are the things that operate inside buildings that you don't see. Those are the ones that are worrying. How do you ensure that social distancing is applied in a call center? As someone who's worked in a call center and worked in retail for, for a long time, prior to getting involved in the trade union um, movement as an official, the fact of the matter is, is that unless there are very clear lines and the employer knows what they are supposed to be doing, but actually that the, wor the worker, the individual feels protected and they know what they can do in terms of what their actual employment rights are. You know, you, you, if any person out there that feels unsafe can actually refuse to work. And what we have been trying to do is that in the discussions that we are having with government, we are saying to them that let's not rush ahead. Let's not make the mistakes that England have already made. We've seen over the last few days what happened with London Transport and what's already happening. Most people, as the lockdown begins to ease, whichever work sector it is, people are going to be needing to use public transport to, to get there. How are we going to make sure that people who work in those sectors that are there are going to be able to protect themselves, but also protect the public? These are the worries that I have now. Um, in terms of the economy, of course, we are really concerned about what potentially could be um, around the corner as far as uh, the future of the economy is concerned, a potential recession um, being talked about. But more than anything else, what I am really concerned about is some of the, the stuff that's been leaked, these leaked reports about, well, who's going to pay for the financial crisis? It's going to be the same people that are paying now with their lives. That's not good enough. That is not the kind of that's not the kind of Wales that we, would, we should want to live in. That's not the kind of UK that we should be wanting to live in. And from my perspective, and part of the reason why today um, we're due to have discussions with Welsh Government and other social partners this afternoon. Um, this, uh, today we, we put out a series of Wales to UC principles as far as easing of the lockdown is concerned. And, and, we've, and we, we've made our sort of um, uh, position very clear. We need to have capacity for greater testing. We need a comprehensive testing strategy and a return to contact tracing. That needs to be um, factored in before um, anything else actually happens. That needs to take into account the ONS data on occupation, on ethnicity and other coronavirus related deaths. Um, we need to be looking at PPE supply. We need to make sure that when we are talking about PPE supply, we're also not taking away PPE from those people in health and social care who actually need it. We need to make sure the workplaces are safe and that people are able to access what is needed. We need to make sure that sectoral guidance is agreed between unions and employers and is actually issued under the, um, the Health Protection Regulations 2020. Um, we need to be looking at what measures employers are going to be implementing when it comes to vulnerable workers, including BAME workers, including pregnant workers and disabled workers as well. We need to make sure that we have enforcement. The great thing here, of course, is, is that we have got uh, the social distancing, the two meter rule is within law. We need to make sure that um, we have a system in place, that we have um, a, you know, we've called for the creation of a, a national forum of social partners um, that, and, and relevant enforcement agencies who can work together to improve people's lives and to make sure the workplaces are safe and the risk assessments and practices are available publicly and people know how to keep themselves safe. And then finally, we need to be maximizing opportunities stemming from the job retention scheme. I'm you know, really concerned um, for uh, those workers at the moment that haven't actually been able to um, uh, benefit from the job retention scheme. We know there are many workers who are on zero hour contracts. We know there are many people who, who work on a you know, daily wage basis particular concerns for taxi drivers. They kind of fall outside of that 
transport responsibility that Welsh Government currently has? Who is going to make sure that those, uh, those types of workers are kept safe? Who is going to be, you know, will the responsibility come from the local authorities? Are they going to be, how, how are those workers um, going to keep themselves and their passengers safe? So there's lots of different questions. But finally, just to add, in terms of redundancies, what's going to happen with young people? those people who are potentially going to be who are going to be leaving education shortly what does their future look like what is the kind of wales that we want to be there's there was discussions that took place when we were set to to leave the eu that's still on the cards are we now in a different space where do we where does this fit on an international global level what does social justice look like what do workers' rights look like? Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Shavana. Thank you to everybody on our panel. Um, there's always this moment after everybody's spoken when I think, right, what is the, what is the thing to pull through next from, from this conversation? The questions that are coming from uh, the chat room are around equal representation in terms of decision making. And that's something that's come through very strongly from the presentations that each of you have made. Uh, who's making the decisions, the clarity of communication about those decisions, key uh, focus obviously on rights and responsibilities for both employers and employees and that that is still that is shifting and changes, changing still but there is a bedrock on which that needs to be um, uh, that bedrock on which which needs to be reinforced. I think um, I'd like to come Ali to you in particular around how do we, the one question that came through, how do we make sure that vulnerable women, particularly BAME women, are removed from the front line if risk assessments show that they're uh, even, even more at risk than others? What sort of conversations and what sort of practicalities are being worked through at the moment to, to protect them? Yeah, so, <clears throat> sorry. So I'm not sure what the practicalities are in place, but, you know, I think we need to, if the, if the risks and the science are showing that they're more at risk, just like you know the furlough scheme at the moment where you know we need to be putting the putting people out of the out of the firing line so support them we need to financially look for resources to keep them at home uh, if they are showing that they're most at risk there's, i don't think there's anything else we can do really is you know we need to make sure that anybody who's at risk obviously this house is at the moment they're showing it's be it's being communities so we need to find the resources to remove them i, I believe from that risk there Okay, Karis. Oriel, can I chip in? There? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think there's a really practical issue here around um, how we assess risk and impact of decisions that are being made now and in the longer term. So if we think about a lot of our workplaces, um, a lot of risk assessment will be taken from a sort of health and safety perspective and so when we think about social distancing and enforcing two meters and all of that kind of thing, it's taken very much from a health and safety perspective. What the people undertaking those assessments don't often have is the skill or understanding about the impact on different protected characteristics. That's a whole different skill set about that people will need to understand when undertaking risk assessments about who will be most adversely affected about some of the decisions that we're making and I just think there's lots of little um, nuances like that that could have a really big impact um, if we just take a very literal approach to assessing risk um, as we go forward then we will just plunder into the same problems that we've always faced and exacerbate the problems that have been shown in stark context. So there's, some, there's something here about, about not making any assumptions that the, the ways we used to have before about checking things out are, are right for this new reality anymore. So we make no assumptions and we continue to yeah, ask and questions. That's right. And make sure that people who are involved in asking yeah, those and, questions and also reflect the communities that we're talking about, that we're talking with. And I'm data sure is key there, you know, ensuring that we disaggregated data to be able to to understand that and we and I think you know to some extent we're doing better at that in Wales um, perversely um, than other parts of the UK because at least we're looking at the impact of different groups 
So, uh, but you know, you have to go beyond that to what do you do about it. Uh, Shivana, is there, is there data you think that is missing that would help us make some of these decisions uh, in, the, in the coming weeks and months? Because we know that, that some of that is, is uh, it, uh, some, you know, for instance, you know, it was, it was striking that it, social media, it was Caroline Criado Perez's book about um, invisible women that really brought the issue around PPE to the fore. And it's shocking that something like that is needed to bring something very, very practical into, into, the, into the light. But is there stuff that we need to make better decisions? And what's, what do you know about which is, which is building towards that? So we always said right from the start of all of this that um, PPE, um, always needs to be um, appropriate for the wearer and it needs to be made available. People are naturally made in different, you know, shapes and sizes. And that was, you didn't need to be a genius to figure that one out. You didn't need a scientist or someone, a specialist to tell you that, right? That's basic. We all know we're not all the same, same shape and size. So why would PPE be any different? Um, my concern um, is at the moment that as far as testing data is concerned, um, we are currently not collecting data on ethnicity. There's quite a lot of data actually that's missing on testing. So as part of the community test and trace system, that needs to be factored in. How else are we genuinely going to understand um, what happened what's, and what's happening at the moment in terms of the impact on different um, different sections of, of communities in Wales. Um, I also would say that speaking to workers on a daily basis, speaking to being workers, the, the key thing for people is that um, they are, they have, they're in a position where they have, they're dealing with long-standing inequality issues. They're dealing with systemic structural discrimination and racism. So their concern is that if they are immediately taken off duties and appropriate risk assessments um, aren't taken place before that happens, then it's just going to add on to the problems that they already face. So we don't want to be in a position where we're going to be making lives harder for individuals. We need to put appropriate measures in place to make sure that people are protected. Those workers have also, of course, then said that if you take us off duties, what happens in the future when the employer makes a decision that actually we can't afford to keep as many people on as we would like to? Who's going to be the first that gets taken off that list? more than likely it will be those workers that weren't working at the time. Who were invisible, yeah. Who were invisible. So it is all about um, being seen, and therefore it is important that we, that we think about these things um, in, 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 the, in, in the full context, and that they, the, the, the government, as well actually the UK guidance at the moment, when it comes to risk assessments and equality, they've made references to disabled workers and women but actually, at the UK level, the referencing to being workers has been removed altogether. It's not there. So we're determined that here in Wales, at least, that when we are talking about risk assessments um, for workplaces and guidance, that being workers specifically are referenced very clearly and that there's no get out clause here. Yeah, thanks, Shivana. Nesta, um, the, the challenges and the risks that the workforce of the NHS have, um, have, have had to shoulder uh, over the past eight weeks and, and longer than that and continuing are both personal and professional and that's come through very clearly um, in a way that has not been the same for lots of other, for lots of other people. Um, can, can we just talk a bit about some of those issues around the different, you know, different levels of, of roles. One question from Laura McAllister around intersectionality. Is, is class and socioeconomic status actually more significant in all of this than gender or ethnicity and race because of the roles that people have within the system in terms of health and social care? So in regards to the NHS, I think from the very beginning, we've work very, very closely with our trade union partners and the Royal Colleges. And I think 
the, the public support for the NHS was there from the very beginning when uh, we, were, we were seeing what was happening in Italy and we were preparing for the, the field hospitals, so the, the surge of patients. Um, and then within a week or so, I think the NHS was saying, you know, we need to look at social care, we need to support our social care colleagues, we need to support care homes. And I think the spotlight is really on the care homes now and is on that profession who, you know, are paid less than the NHS. And I think one of the, the challenges that we we have always faced and will face in the future is around pay between the health and social care system. And, you know, there has been a lot of work around what does the future health and social care workforce look like in the future? And this was before the pandemic. And one of the biggest challenges is around pay and conditions. And I think that's quite apparent as well when it's come to this this pandemic as well when it comes to you know supply of PPE and the way that PPE has been distributed has at the beginning been different um, but the supply is there and I think you know talking on behalf of our members I think there is the confidence that supply is there both for frontline workers within health and social care but then there are challenges then with wider key workers. So your police officers, your, you know, your, your bus drivers, as uh, Shvana highlighted earlier. So, you know, PP is, is a, been a challenge from the, from the beginning and, and will continue to, to, to be. So the health and social care, uh, the, there's a distinct disparity and there has been a distinct dis disparity in terms of how we value people who provide social care on the, on the one provide care in all sorts of different forms, but the value of social care and care homes in particular and care, which is uh, commissioned by local authorities, doesn't have the same status and isn't valued, hasn't been valued mm -hmm. in the same way as, as the NHS. No, That's something that has come to the fore much, much mm -hmm. more as a result. So there are going to be big challenges also mm -hmm. thinking about Welsh government funding you know, recognising obviously that 50% of, over 50% of uh, Welsh Government budget goes to the NHS at the moment. The shift that is going to be needed to think about how, what we value and how we measure what we value, that has to change. Yeah, and I think it's having that public debate. I think the public is fully aware of what the NHS is and what it does, but there is confusion, I think, in regards to social care. And be, you know, and I think people accessing social care aren't aware of the fact that there you know it is it does cost and how how different it is whether it's local authority um, funded social care or whether it's pro private providers so I think you know during this pandemic hopefully there has been more of an understanding and recognition of what social care provides in our local communities yeah so uh, lots further to go on that on that front We've got time for a, a couple more questions, I think. One of them is uh, from Shireen Williams. What happens to groups who have no jobs to return to and no recourse to emergency funds because the COVID-19 schemes are dealing with now and what comes next? Keris, can I come to, to you on that, please? And then Ali. Yeah, well, I think we've seen by the way that the announcements were made by the UK government and drip, drip feeding of different schemes and changes to schemes that there are almost inevitably going to be groups and individuals left behind and we probably all experience that in our own families and as you said at the beginning Oriel those of us with jobs um, uh, are not having to worry about putting food on the table but I have family members who are self-employed much lower paid in insecure employment who are really really worried about their long-term future and, and what they're going to be able to do you know and I think I want to just sort of bring this point back to the question around should is social is socioeconomic um, or class background more important than gender or race we can't separate them out because the the structural inequalities around gender and uh, race and ethnicity absolutely contribute to people's socioeconomic position uh, where they find themselves in the labour market. So 
how that inequality interplays that results in different outcomes for different people. So I don't think we can take a simple lens to it. And I think if there's anything that we need to all be asking ourselves is individually within our organisations and how we push for change in government and other places of power and influence, are we going to be brave enough to respond to this crisis differently? Um, and whose voices are otherwise going to be heard? Because you can bet your bottom dollar that the CBI and other business interests will apps and trade unions through the social partnership will be there. But what about those voices who aren't represented and how do we all take some responsibility for ensuring they're heard? Thanks. Ali, can I ask you a question? Do you feel your voice is being heard only on issues in relation to race and migration? Or is your voice being heard across a wide, a wide spectrum of issues? Because some of the conversations I'm having, for instance, with some of our members is that we're, if they're telling me, you know, I'm not normally in these sorts of conversations. I'm in a conversation about this because that's what I'm known for being, being involved in. But actually, my experience and my perspective is valid right across the board, but I'm not included in these conversations over here. Is that your experience too? Yeah, I would think so, definitely. And I think we, <clears throat> we need to get better at that. I think, you know, um, if we are around uh, tables or conversations virtually, uh, and we recognise that, you know, there are people missing that we know would add value to those conversations, we need to put our hands up and say, actually, you know, I think so-and-so should be here or so-and-so should be here because, you know, otherwise we're going to continue to miss uh, those communities out of the conversation uh, and, you know, the, the damage is going to already get, uh, it's, it's going to get exacerbated even further, especially if they can add a lot of value, uh, get into communities easier, uh, ask and engage and, you know, get some, uh, you know, the research and the questions answered for you quite quickly. Um, and there are young people involved in our youth forum with Race Council in Cambry, who we've been engaging with around uh, education and employment at the moment. And so, yeah, there, there are some real anxious young people, uh, particularly with predicted grades, uh, particularly around they're graduating this year, not knowing, um, you know, whether or not they'll get the grades that they, they, they expected to get. Uh, so yeah, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's some of them are fearing for their futures at the moment. So a lot of, a lot of uncertainty you know, Absolutely. right right across the board. And I guess, um, Shivana and Esther, you know, one of the challenges at the moment is that the government talks to people it knows already and they keep, you know, can, and we, it, there is a danger that we go to people we know rather than people we don't know and their voices aren't being heard. What can be done, practically speaking, to build different, stronger, more resilient networks, the ones that Ali's just been talking about now that are rooted in people's lived and everyday experiences of things. And make sure that, because some of the problems that we're, we're seeing are relevant to this sector, but also have an interplay with something else. So there's issues obviously around education, young people, mental health and the economy that actually cannot just be talked about by one set of civil servants in one area. Yeah, um, we, we do actually work uh, very closely with WCBA um, and other social partners as well. If anything, I mean, I, I, I took on this role uh, quite well, actually only a couple of months ago. Um, so, so for me, being in this position is, is still quite a new thing. And then all of this happened. Um, but before I, before I did that, and I always have been very connected um, at a grassroots level with community and third sector organisations, I think that the, the, way that, you, the, the way that you change things is by working in collaboration. And um, as Ali says, if you feel that there are voices that are missing around the table, that you, that you point that out and that you work to um, ensure that those additional voices are added in. I mean, I would say that... <clears throat> One of the things that we should be looking at um, in Wales is that at the moment we are social security is um, still with the UK government. Um, I would like to see us maybe doing some modeling on tax revenues and funding models for Wales. Um, and I think that we, we, we need to be ready um, for the fact that there is a high chance that the UK government is going to go hard again. Um, because they've already made it, you know, some of the leaked stuff, as I've referenced earlier, about who's going to pay for what happens next, who's going to pay for this crisis. And there's a high possibility that we could end up with even further austerity. So we need to be ready for that. 
Um, I think in the chat box, somebody referred to the, uh, the Fair Work Forum for Social Care. Um, again, we, that needs to be established really quickly. We've been talking to, to government throughout all of this and said that, that it would have been really helpful for that to have been set up. Um, and I also think that uh, we should be looking to campaign for Welsh Government to legislate to, to organise private and not-for-profit social care employers in local and, and regional structures so that they are reachable and that um, they have a voice um, in social partnership discussions that we currently engage with. I think there's a number of things that we can be doing, but it, it does go back down to the fact that there will there's the big worry for us is going to be what happens next and those workers that i mean were furloughed some workers i haven't actually been furloughed on 80 percent we've had cases where some people have been furloughed on 40 percent and employers have chosen to keep back some money so there's lots of strange things that are going on um and i'm glad that ken skates yesterday came out and said that you know anyone any business that receives any specific additional funding from Welsh government and they have um, a registered a tax haven elsewhere then you know we're going to be coming for you so i'm glad that those things are being said and, and it's important that, the, that we don't take the our eye off the ball about what happens next thank you and yes a very clear message from the government on that yesterday uh, Nesta, you know as 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 we move slowly and uncertainly out of lockdown without a clear plan for that at the moment, you know, it's likely that many workplaces are going to move to more remote working um, and prolonging the impact on women, women in particular. And that's harder for some parts of, of the sector in which you work. What sort of what sort of changes do you see do you see ahead? So in regards to the NHS, it's, it's the staff, like you said, it's maintaining and ensuring that the staff are supported uh, and working with the trade unions and the Royal Colleges to ensure that, you know, all staff feel supported and there is compassion across the leadership in the NHS and we are working closely together across all the health boards of the trust, but also with local authority partners and we are very clear that the health of the population isn't only, you know, it's not just the NHS that can support and maintain people's health and well-being. It is all public sector. It's all society. And I think once we get, you know, past this phase one of COVID, because the likelihood is there will be another peak, what about the population's health and well-being, specifically mental health? So we are aware that there is significant, there will be a crisis when it comes to mental health. And from speaking to colleagues in England, where the system is quite separate, where you have mental health trusts separate from the acute, they have said, once this is over, you need to support us because our mental health practitioners have supported you during the pandemic. But are you going to support us in the community when this pandemic is over? And luckily in Wales, we have integrated health boards and we have that social partnership with um, trade unions uh, and other public sector partners. So I think we are better prepared here. And with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, we're also better prepared and the, the networks are already in, in place. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to start to wrap things up. Could I come to each of you on the panel, please, with um, a reason to be cheerful? Because I think we all, we all need them. Um, is there something that uh, you think, oh, that's a really cracking, positive example of something good which has come out of that, that you want to stick with us, that we want to keep? For whatever comes next because we're not talking about going back to normal at the iwa we're certainly not talking about going back to normal we're not talking about what a new normal is we're not talking about building back better we're talking about building a more resilient community and a more resilient society that protects and supports people who are more vulnerable and more at risk of uh, of, of exploitation personal and professional and we're talking about a society that measures different and values a different way of living and a 
different way of working and what contributions we can all make to that. So if we're talking about a society that can withstand sudden shocks, like the one we're in at the moment, external ongoing stresses over which we have no control because they are the system, how do we shift those systems? And also the uncertainty. Normally, uh, a crisis has one of those factors in it. This crisis is, has all three and simultaneously and ongoing. It's something that's a very different way of doing. This is not a, a war or a terrorist attack because there is no single enemy in this. This is a complete recasting of how we live, what matters and how we organize ourselves therefore as a result. What do you want to stick with us as we go into our, our new reality? Because it's going to affect each and every one of us in very different ways. Ali, what do you want to keep? Um, I think we need to keep the conversations going. I think, um, uh, you know, platforms like this where you bring it together, uh, people, I think is really important. Uh, I think people, like you mentioned earlier, if they are missing, we need to definitely recognise who they are uh, and try to include them as much as possible. Um, I think we're smaller and, and better as a nation together uh, here in Wales uh, that we don't have to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, pay attention to the mistakes that they're making uh, over in England that we can really, really, truly, you know, um, get to grips with COVID-19 and, uh, and move forward together as a nation so long as we're all pulling together. Okay, thank you. Keris? Um, a personal one and a professional one. Professionally, I think, you know, we've all got to grips with the tech. Let's make sure that we can continue to work in a modern way using the flexibility and agility that we can but ensuring that people aren't left behind so use it as something to actually further reduce inequality by giving access to work to those who previously haven't had it personally trying to hold on to some of the work-life balance i've probably never spent more time with my kids that's really nice i don't want to give it up my garden looks better than ever and i'm lucky to have one i want to keep some of that perspective afterwards and not just get into all the bad habits that that many of us have around work and, and the guilt that goes with that. Okay, thank you. Nesta? I think that the key thing is around innovation. So things have happened overnight sometimes in the NHS and in public sector, which we've been talking about for, for years. And as a result of the pandemic, these things have happened overnight. So it's continuing with innovation. And yes, being aware of the barriers and the challenges, but not you know, forgetting the outcome that we want to, to reach. And it's a joint outcome. So it's not the NHS wanting one outcome and local authorities and other partners wanting another. It's, it's working across all public sector, private sector, trade unions and third sector to ensure that you know, we are all going in the same way and we've got the same vision for, for the future of Wales. Okay, thank you very much. Shavana. For me, what's been interesting is that I would say this has forced us into a position of um, improving relationships um, where there have been some breakdowns uh, and um, building new, uh, new links and, and new relationships. And I would want to keep those and I want us to, to keep moving in that sort of direction. Um, I'm, I, I'm, what I would like to see is that um, genuinely that the the same round of applause that it goes back to for me um clapping those workers that we don't forget them and that we fight for them um when 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 we need to we will need to we are going to need to stand up for those workers um and that we don't forget anybody because actually there's a number of people that have fallen through the cracks already and um several individuals who are daily wages zero hour contracts many of them who are facing all kinds of further insecurity, those are the ones that we need to, to make sure that, that we keep in mind and that they're around the table with us. It's, it's always about representation and not talking um, about the other, but you know, having everyone um, with equal voices and actually um, understanding and accepting that we do have inequality, there is, structural inequality that does and barriers that do need to be removed. So one of the things that we've been talking about, thanks Rana, is um, you know this is not this is, we're not all in the same boat 
they were in a we're in a we're in very different storms we're in the same storm but very different boats some of them may be copper bottom some of them have had holes in for a long time some of them are blow up dinghies that have been patched endlessly um, and we're going to need to shift our balance the people balancing the boat are going to, need to respond to every single situation and we're going to need a strong strong person on the on the tiller at the back and clear lookouts wondering for what sort of what sort of obstacles are lurking in murky waters both underneath us and around the next rocks and that's a very 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 different way of being in terms of our everyday life and our everyday work as well thank you to all our panelists this morning thanks to the delegates who have stayed with um, Ali Abdi, Keris Furlong, Nesta Lloyd-Jones and Shivana Taj if you want to receive early notifications of future IWA events and recordings of all of our Rethinking Wales sessions best thing to do is join us as a member go to IWA wales about us and support us next week we're going to be focusing on place and the future of welsh towns uh, finally obviously while you're welcome to leave the discussion straight away and zoom on to your next zoom call we are leaving our chat function open for another 15 minutes or so in case there are thoughts or suggestions or reflections or contacts that you want to make with people that are on the call at the moment please remember everything is recorded and thank you very much indeed good afternoon thank you